test, 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 test. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We want to come to order. We want to come to order this morning. We want to start start our uh, Sunday school <laughs> study. Amen. I'll give, uh, give us all an opportunity to grab our seats. <laughs> and we remember we have between our, our Sunday school and our Bible study, we have an opportunity to visit and fix our food. So if we could move on. I got a timeline here. And we have members who are online waiting for us to get moving. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise. Thank you, Lord. I'm ready. Amen. <laughs> All right. Welcome, uh, those of you who are here in person, and those of you who are in uh, cyberspace, we welcome you to our midweek services here at Park Avenue Missionary Baptist Church in Riverside, California. Reverend Ellie Campbell is pastor. Uh, welcome to this uh, specific segment of our teaching today. This is our Sunday school lesson, uh, lesson number four uh, for Sunday, March 24th, 2024. Uh, the unit that we're studying right now is unit one, faithful versus faithless. And our subject today is when the world is against us, when the world is against us. So let's look to the Lord, ask him to help us in our efforts, and um, we'll move on with our lesson. Father in heaven, we come humbly, uh, acknowledging that you are uh, the creator of heaven and earth, that you're omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and immutable. Father, we thank you that you... Um, exude love, that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son to die in our stead. He suffered, bled, and died, but he rose again on the third day for our justification. We thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit who empowers us, who leads and guides us and intercedes for us uh, with you. So, Father, now as we go into our lesson, we ask that you bless us, that you take us down into the deep treasures of your word, help us rightly divide the word of truth. Yes, Lord. Thank you. We ask that blessing also for uh, 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 Reverend Greg as he will uh, teach his segment. Uh, and, and we pray, Father, that you just pull back the curtains of our minds so we will be able to receive what you would have us receive. Uh, so that we may be stronger and so that we may be about your business. So, Father, we ask that you bless those who are here in person in attendance and bless those who are out in cyberspace. Keep them according to your will. Father, we ask a special blessing upon our pastor that you uh, uh, attend according to your will, Father, attend to his spiritual, physical, and emotional needs and that he will be found doing what you've commissioned him to do. So we thank you, Father. Help us, keep us, and as we always want to do, Father, is magnify and glorify you, edify the saints of God. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. For his sake we pray, amen. 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 amen, praise God. All right, so when the world is against us, that is our subject today. Uh, our devotional reading is found in the book of Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, and the first 14 verses. Um, 
We also, our background scripture is found in the sixth chapter of Acts. Uh, if you have not uh, um, read it or in your study time this week, I encourage you to, uh, to read that entire second chapter. And you may want to start with the fifth uh, chapter um, as you, as you uh, uh, pursue your study. Our print passage today is found in the book of Acts, the sixth chapter, the seventh through the 15th verses. And uh, what I'll do is uh, draw your attention. We'll read our key verse momentarily, but we do have two analysis of the biblical text. Uh, the first is a formidable witness, a formidable witness found in Acts 6, 7 through 11, and then a marked witness found in Acts, the 6th chapter, the 12th through the 15th verses. I uh, encourage you to read the, the biblical context. There's some great information uh, in there. Read, read also our introduction. And uh, in our Sunday school books, those of you who have them, and that will give you some additional information on to our, our lesson. Uh, we do have some lesson aims. Uh, first aim is to consider that Stephen was strengthened uh, when faced with false accusations and persecutions. Uh, acknowledge ways that the love of Christ and the Holy Spirit encourage and strengthen our faith. And the third, bear witness to personal faith and trust in Christ in the face of threat and danger. So I want to draw your attention now to our handout. Uh, we want to, and I've, I provided the key verse in the NIV. Um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll read the King James Version, and then together we can read uh, the NIV. King James Version uh, of Acts 6, 9 through 10. There arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and of them Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Let's read NIV together. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it is called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Amen. Acts 6, 9 through through 10. By way of background, uh, we see here that the book of Acts was known, also is known, should be known as the Acts of the Apostles, is also known uh, rather as the Acts of the Apostles, but it could perhaps more accurately be titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. We, found, we find that throughout the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit working, first to establish the church, then to, to strengthen it in its infancy, uh, because, frankly, people tried to kill the church before it even crawled. And, and so we see how the Holy Spirit um, um, protected the church and brought the church along. And that's why I recommend to you to read the fifth chapter uh, of, of Acts because it, it shows you uh, what the Holy Spirit, uh, um, what he did in terms of uh, establishing early uh, the, the, um, the direction uh, of, of the church. So... This title, uh, The Acts of the Holy Spirit Through the Apostles, better reflects the content of the book, uh, in which chronicles, as I said, the great deeds of the apostles and other significant believers in the early church. Uh, the book was written about uh, 
around A.D. 60, 62, and it picks up where the gospel according to Luke left off, provides a valuable account of how the church grew and spread from Jerusalem into the rest of the Roman Empire, into the known world at that time. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, uh, again, as I pointed out, the church in its infancy. Uh, the book, uh, which was also written by Luke, uh, the purpose of the, the book was to establish for Theophilus uh, to strengthen his faith and give him information as to uh, uh, the, the doctrine uh, of Jesus Christ and, and how, uh, how the, the church uh, was established. So what, what Acts does is it captures the transition from taking the gospel exclusively to a Jewish audience uh, to reaching out to Gentiles, primarily under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And we shouldn't be surprised at this because what, what did the Lord say uh, way in the beginning? What did he, what did he tell Adam? Uh, what did he tell Abraham? Uh, the Lord's promise to uh, use his chosen people as a conduit uh, uh, into salvation for the Gentiles uh, is, is clear. It's clear throughout uh, the Bible. So we find that the book of Acts is uh, really the rec a, a remarkable record of the church's, early church's journey, ending with Paul on the verge of taking the gospel to the highest government official in the land, the Emperor Nero, the Emperor of Rome. So um, <coughs> there are a lot of things that happen after the book of Acts ends, which we won't get into today, but um, but this was a very uh, a formative time, an important time uh, for the church. So with that, let's move to our first analysis of the biblical text, a formidable witness. And let's read the seventh and the eighth verses in the NIV. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests came to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among them. All right. So our timeline here, it, it starts actually in Acts 5. And, and the church grew rapidly under the apostles' teaching as they were led by the Holy Spirit. Christians were, were moved by the Spirit to sell their possessions and property in order to support converts as the apostles taught the fundamentals of the faith. And, and I have to always hearken back to, to what Pastor uh, uh, has told us on, on more than one occasion. Um, people were in, in Jerusalem for the holiday, right? They came for the Passover, uh, day of Pentecost. Uh, they came for, for these feast days, these celebrations. And so we, we all know that when we go on vacation, uh, we, we allot uh, parts of our budget for that vacation, don't we? And what happens when the money runs out? Ready to go home. Ready to go home. Got to go home. Got to go home. But, but something happened here. The Holy Spirit made his advent yeah. on the day of Pentecost. Folks right, were still, right. still in town. They had to be taught. They had to be... Uh, they had to be supported. So uh, there were members uh, of the church who actually sold their possessions and property in order to support uh, the converts as the apostles taught them the fundamentals of the faith. Now, we should remember that the apostles who were frightened and disillusioned after Jesus' death were now emboldened to preach and teach Jesus Christ because they were eyewitnesses to his resurrection. So from being, from being scared, uh, 
uh, petrified, paralyzed. Uh, uh, they witness the risen Lord. And then what happens on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit makes his advent. Uh, and uh, the church age begins. So these men had been empowered by the Holy Spirit to work wonders among the uh, people as they boldly preach the good news. Amen. The, the, uh, the apostles worked wonder. They, they were enabled by the Holy Spirit to show evidence of the fact that they had been uh, uh, commissioned by the Lord himself to carry uh, the word to others. Amen. Now, the apostles got into trouble uh, with the re religious establishment, specifically the Sadducees, who became jealous of the apostles' influence over the people. The Sadducees held to these beliefs. First, they rejected the idea of fate or a preordained future. God, they also uh, uh, believe that God does not commit or even think evil. And uh, that man, they rejected uh, that man had free will. They rejected that the soul, they said the soul was not uh, immortal and that there was no afterlife and no rewards or penalties after death. And lastly, they believe that it is a virtue to debate and dispute with philosophy teachers. So this is what the Sadducees uh, 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 believed. And they were, uh, the, the Sadducees, their sect was one of the four main sects, S-E-C-T-S. -S. It sounds like I'm putting the X on the back of that. So uh, they, they were four groups, and they were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, uh, the Zealots, and the Essenes. Did I say that right? The Essenes. The Rhodians. Okay. And, and so uh, you had these four groups. So the Sadducees were basically uh, uh, politically connected. Uh, they derived their influence uh, uh, from being politically connected to Rome. Uh, they were focused on wealth and political power. Hmm. Wealth and political power. So now their jealousy led to the persecution of the apostles. The apostles were seized. They were jailed. They were brought before the Sanhedrin, and they were subsequently beaten, but they continued to preach Jesus Christ. They continued to do that. So that tells you how they were emboldened and empowered by the Holy Spirit himself. Now, as in every organization, as the church grew, a conflict between the Hebrews and the Hellenists uh, because the widows of the Hellenists were not receiving a fair share of the daily provision. The Hebrews were the Palestinian Jews, and the Hellenists were uh, the Jews that who had embraced uh, Greek culture. So there, there was this, this suspicion between these two groups anyway. Uh, and the Palestinian Jews felt that the, the Hellenists were basically sellouts uh, because they hadn't uh, maintained uh, to, to the, the Palestinian Jews, the Hebrews, hadn't maintained their, their satisfaction, the customs, the, the rights in, in, uh, of, uh, of Judaism. So we have the widows of the Hellenists who weren't receiving Provision. At least this is where the conflict arose. So the first conflict in the church here, huh? And, and does conflict still uh, uh, exist today? Yes. Yeah. yeah, what have we been stu studying in the last few weeks is that we should endeavor, we should actively seek to keep uh, conflict down and practice unity yeah, yeah. In, in, in the church. So... Conflicts are going to arise because we're human beings. 
and and we have and and we have uh, 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 human nature. So this is what the apostles did, I believe and know, led by the Spirit. They asked the people to recommend seven men, full of the Spirit and wisdom, to take care of the matter. Well, what was the matter? To wait tables. Now, there's an interesting thing. This just didn't mean food tables. It it actually may have meant something uh, uh, even more significant. Now, tables was uh, um, that uh, the idea of tables, especially in that time, was one, you know, you could eat at a table, mm -hmm. or that was where business was conducted. So uh, uh, the apostles didn't have time for that, to look into provisions and handle money and, and, and all these things. So they asked the people to recommend seven men full of wi spirit and wisdom to take care of the matter. They needed spirit and they needed wisdom. We need that in the church today. Yes. We need people to work in the church who are led by the Holy Spirit. Also, they have wit uh, wisdom in different aspects of, of, uh, of ministry. So Stephen and six others were chosen to serve the people. Uh, we, we know they were Hellenists because they all had Greek names. And I'm, um, we'll, we'll uh, deal with that. Well, we won't deal with it here. But if you go in, if, if you read uh, between verses 1 and 6, it gives you more uh, more information on who these men were. So this conflict in the church had been averted. And so what happened, that what the apostles recommended, uh, the people were pleased with that. They chose among them seven men. And these seven men were then brought to the apostles. The apostles confirmed uh, uh, what... Uh, what the uh, uh, the people had, you know, the nominations that the people had made, and this this was important. The apostles were the leaders of of the church, and it was necessary for them to confirm. They they were wise, led by the Holy Spirit to choose. The apostles were wise to bring it to the people and let them have a buy-in. But in, in, uh, in the end, the apostles had to confirm uh, these, these men to serve. So with this act, uh, uh, conflict in the church had been averted, and the apostles were free to pray and to preach. That was their job, to give themselves to prayer and to preach. And as a result of this, the church grew rapidly, and many priests were converted. Uh, a gifted Stephen performed many miracles, and he amazed the people. He amazed the people. Sister Mitch. Yes, Mitch. Uh, <laughs> how how long long did uh, this period last? This I'm gonna just call it the vacation extension last. Was I mean because this a lot has happened in just that statement. You know, they're, they're getting together people to agree on seven people. I mean, people stayed away from their homes, it seemed like, for a very long time. Right. So, I mean, was it years or we don't know? I, you know, I, I don't know. Okay. Maybe Pastor Greg can help me out in terms of No, I'm just kind of curious because uh, people don't usually agree on things quickly. And I'm thinking people being away from their home, like me, I get tired of vacation. Well, the, <laughs> these people had to be taught. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we're going to find with Stephen's, uh, um, with Stephen's uh, 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 martyrdom, when he was killed, uh, what, what the Holy Spirit did was he stirred the nest. He, yeah. he, he, uh, uh, he got people up and going. Persecution is what pushed the people out uh, of, of Jerusalem because you know they were they were just staying there they were learning yeah. they were being taught but so they just moved there they were moved by persecution oh, okay 
by the Jewish authorities. But in terms of your, your question, I don't, I don't have a, 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 a time period. Maybe I'll get my head together with Greg and Reverend Brookins and Pastor. Yeah, that, well, it's a good question. She's talking about the first church after Acts two when they got together. Yeah. Now we're now we're in the now we in, in Acts six, where the church is growing and now they ain't got enough people to do the business of the church. I think you asking the same question, right? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Uh huh. See, that's what you get. These putting up a provocative question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I guess what I'm trying to say, we got. We had the apostles coming together. They can't do all the business. They're getting people to help them. But he, they wisely asked the, the, the people who are there, the right, the, the church, to pick these people. So that, that gives me the impression that this, this, first, is this first gathering or is this the second gathering, this development of the church took a long time. I mean, it didn't just like, okay, we're now the church, we all believe, yeah, 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 yeah. But I, mean, I was just kind of wondering, what's the time span of uh -huh. the development of our first uh -huh. church? It doesn't say well, that. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, this was the beginning. These were the same people who were converted on the day of Pentecost. Right. And they stayed in Jerusalem. For, for forever, right? No, not forever. Oh. Because Jewish persecution forced them to go home. They got they had to they had to leave. So they left after But our lesson our lesson is where you are. Okay. It's right where you are. Your lesson. <laughs> and by this time there were it's estimated there are about twenty thousand Christians, those who had converted, they call that they call that actually the way. They were first the called Christians at the Church of Antioch. Here. I'm sorry. This, we're at the time where they were established and before they were dispersed. Yes. Yes. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> because you verbalized it, but a whole lot of folks were wondering. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So you help. You help more than just yourself. You know? All right, let's read verse 9, 10, and 11. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene, Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then he secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard speak, speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. All right, so opposition arose, and, and this is what, what the church always experienced. It experienced it then. Uh, the Apostle Paul experienced it, uh, it in his, uh, on his missionary journeys where the Judaizers would come behind him to discredit and tear down his preaching. Uh, so uh, uh, opposition was no, uh, was, was not, uh, um, they weren't a stranger to opposition. So we have members of, of this synagogue of the free men and uh, my study notes as I looked at kind of to delve deeper, who, who, were, who were these freedmen? They were slaves who were con conquered by Pompey mm -hmm. and brought to Rome, but they were later freed and, and uh, um, uh, evidently had, had converted to, to Judaism and, and they were uh, uh, members of this, this synagogue. So uh, also, uh, Cyrene and Alexandria, both uh, countries, uh, uh, cities actually in, in northern Africa, 
Alexandria and what is now Egypt, uh, uh, Egypt today, and Cyrene, its own city, and then the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. And, and uh, Paul was from Tarsus, right, which was in the province of Cilicia. But they begin to argue with Stephen, but in their debating, and, and what this argue, argument suggests is that they were debating openly, uh, uh, publicly, uh, with Stephen. But they couldn't withstand his doctrine. The, the, the Holy Spirit had given him the wisdom uh, uh, of what to say and how to say it, and they couldn't stand against it. So what did they do? What was the old playbook? You find somebody to lie and uh, um, uh, on him and, and make accusations. Mm -hmm. So this is what they did to Stephen. Uh, they said this, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Yeah, yeah. Now, we know from the Old Testament that they gave Moses a bad time. But now they're uh, now they're upset because Stephen allegedly spoke blasphemy against Moses. God, Moses wasn't God. Moses was a man. And they added, of course, they they added uh, that uh, they blaspheme uh, uh, God. Now this was a uh, a capital offense. This was an offense that required death in under the law. So here we have this outside opposition from, from the synagogue, these free men. Uh, they openly disputed with Stephen. They couldn't prevail, though. So they secretly conspired with false witnesses who claimed Stephen spoke blasphemy, uh, as I said, against Moses and against God. Let's go to our next uh, uh, analysis of the text a marked witness, verse 12. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified this fellow never stopped speaking will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. So just as the apostles had been drugged before the Sanhedrin, and there was a, uh, this, this was a council in Jerusalem of 70 men. Uh, it was mixed. You had, you had the Pharisees, the Sadducees. You had the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Scholars, the, the, the lawyers, specialists in the law, all were on this, this, uh, this council. And so uh, what they did was they seized Stephen, they actually put hands on him, seized him, and uh, uh, they, they drug him before the Sanhedrin. Now, they used the, uh, and I put it here kind of tongue-in-cheek, a time-honored technique of stirring up the crowd just as they had done with Jesus. They stirred the crowd up, stirred the people up, told them things to get them uh, all, all excited. And there's nothing that's as, uh, um, there's nothing as bad as mob violence, right? Because there's no, there's no really controlling it. The mob kind of takes, uh, you know, a, 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 a life of its own. And we see what, what mobs can do. You know, we see what happened to Paul in Ephesus. We see what happened with Stephen here. We see what happened on January 6th here in the United States. Yeah, yeah. So we, we know that vi mob uh, um, uh, violence uh, is is a thing that can be sparked but not necessarily controlled. So here we have the Sanhedrin had additional motivation, particularly the Pharisees and um, the Sadducees, 
in addition to uh, regaining the favor of the people, the council members' wealth and political power were always also at stake. All right. So this this was a thing that that had uh, 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 wide implications uh, in in terms of of the environment at that time. But so then, yes. I wanted to know what it means meant uh, the public you gnash your teeth at somebody. What can you show us what that do? With how you gnash, how you gnash your teeth at uh, somebody that's uh, obviously being accused of something that uh, it's not easy to be public be called a liar, man. Like like Stephen was. Uh, nobody likes to be called a liar publicly. I, 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 I can even today I can't I can't understand how uh, he was able to maintain his composure in the midst of false accusations. Right? He was indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Now, now, what does it what does it mean to actually Bite. gnash your teeth at somebody? Bite. Oh, like this? Bite. All right. I'm just messing with you, Jay. <laughs> Bite. Bless you. <laughs> All right. Hey, Amen. David, a long time ago, tell, so pay attention to me. Someone tell tell my daughter to come come around under the camera, and her bag is <laughs> here on the table, honey. Or Joni can bring it to you. God bless you. No, God. just the white one. Amen. So <laughs> these false witnesses added that Stephen taught Jesus of Nazareth would destroy Jerusalem and the temple and change the customs uh, Moses had established. Now, Jerusalem and the temple were very <coughs> important to the Jews. Very important. And uh, to, to blaspheme, defame, uh, 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 the, the temple defamed Jerusalem. This really got them hot. So they used this technique uh, to get, get the people riled up. And, and then these fault wit witnesses added because uh, um, uh, added that Stephen taught uh, Jesus of Nazareth would tear all this stuff down. Amen. What Amen. they loved, what they embraced. And, and uh, uh, so uh, they use this, these lies uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, set, basically set Stephen up. Amen. Now note that they said false witnesses. And according to uh, uh, the law, there had to be at least two witnesses to testify against you. Amen. So, they had, they had false witnesses, it's plural. We don't know how many they were, but we know it was two or more. And, and this would establish the veracity, the truthfulness <coughs> of what, what they were saying, at least according to, to the law. All right, let's read 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen as they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So all of the council, all of the Sanhedrin council, they looked intently on Stephen to see what his defense would be. What they saw was Stephen's countenance, which was like that of an angel, the glory of the Lord showing. Now this happened one other time, showing on Stephen's face. This happened one other time, didn't it? Sir. When, yes, when sir. Moses went up on the mountain the second time, the yeah. Lord gave him the second set of tablets. Mm -hmm. and, and when Moses came down, his face shone, didn't it? Yeah. He had to put a veil over it. And the entire council saw this. They're looking intently. They're waiting to see what, what, uh, 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 what Stephen has to say. What they were witnessing, what were they witnessing at the moment? Uh, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in angelic messengers. But Stephen's face shone because the spirit of the living God 
was upon him and in him. Stephen was calm, unruffled, composed as he prepared to offer his defense. And we know, and I think we've, we've, we've covered it uh, in Acts 7, that Stephen would go back to Abraham and rehearse the entire history of Israel. The entire history of, of Israel. Now, at the conclusion of his sermon, we'll cover shortly. But this is where our lesson stops. With, with yeah, with uh, another cliffhanger, with Stephen's face sh shining like that of an angel. Uh, but but the Lord was demonstrating uh, uh, his his power, his glory uh, through Stephen and what Stephen would would say. But I think in order to finish the story, we have to go to Acts seven fifty one through fifty nine. This is what Stephen preached after he went through the whole history. He said this. This is an indictment. You stiff-necked people. <laughs> yeah. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. Mm -hmm. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but not obeyed it. And when the angels here doesn't mean uh, uh, heavenly uh, beings. It means uh, those who were messengers. It's another word for messenger, isn't it? And who were the messengers? The messengers were the prophets. All right. So it was given to you through the prophets, but you never obeyed. And when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious, Tracy, and gnashed their teeth at him. All right, all right, all right. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, standing in a place of honor, standing in a place of authority. This is what Stephen saw. And at this, boy, these guys were something. They covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed Stephen, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. And meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. All right. So Saul, later known as Paul, and Paul was his name. Saul was his name. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't changed. That was his name. And so they laid uh, the, their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning Stephen, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. So thus would begin the persecution of the church and the fleeing of Christians from Jerusalem. Much blood would be shed, but in the process, the way, which Christianity was first known as, would spread throughout the known world. Amen. This was a catalyst, the death, the murder of Stephen. Any questions? Don't make them too hard. Come on, Sister Mitch. I know you got yeah, a question. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> 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 
you you won't you won't be able to you won't be able to sleep if you don't ask your question. <laughs> Well, you know, you know, the pastor has a saying that I love. You eat again. <laughs> all right, all right. You eat again. Come on, brother major. If he'll, he'll probably ask. He'll probably. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. Well, right. Dave, I was just trying to trying to find something. Uh, Sister Mitch was talking about this about the uh, conflict and. So this may help 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 me. Y'all could help me with this. It says in um, between A.D. 30 and 35, the, Pente the Pentecost, the church, the early church in Jerusalem, Pentecost was then. Then you go. Then you go down to uh, A.D. 35 to 47. The, the church grows in Judea and Samaria. Now, could that? been a time frame that maybe all of this was happening? I think so. Because, because when it, the, the next thing is, is talking about um, Oh, that's your uh, Yeah. Okay, cool. Then, then it goes talking about Herod Agrippa. So that's, that's way down and this, this had, has already happened. Yeah, thank you, Brother Major. That kind of. Yeah, that was Philip who went up in with Samaria. Yeah, that kind of puts a, a, a time to it. I like to just, look at your just notes. Since see. everybody is giving me her time. Oh, okay. okay. Sister Mitch is uh, up just, now. This is a, a quick question. Um, with all these people who are against Stephen and all that stuff, you know, why are they so intent upon holding on to that law that was in Numbers and um, it's in Numbers and, and, and Deuteronomy. I was reading those, and I mean, it, it's a lot of laws, a lot of <laughs> different rituals and sacrifice. I mean, you had a sacrifice and a law for everything. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Uh, and then Jesus comes to eliminate all that, right. you know, and they, but they were they just getting money? Uh, that's why they wanted to hold on to that so hard? Because that's a lot of work just to say that you're faithful to God, you know? Well, they, they had a different mindset, and, and they didn't, they didn't uh, grasp the, the um, uh, significance of what Jesus did so they were, they on the cross. The they grew up with these rituals. They grew up uh, under the law. So... That's just like in our culture, right? There's certain things that we embrace and we keep on doing, and it's hard to, to let it loose. And this was part of God's purpose anyway, because his, his purpose for his chosen people was to give them the law so they would understand who God is. But... The, the law was also, in Galatians it says that the law was our, our schoolmaster. If we didn't know, if we didn't have the law, we wouldn't know what sin was, what was, what was wrong. And so the Jews did not embrace Christ, Christianity. They thought him uh, just a regular man. And, and, and so uh, holding on to the law... Uh, was what they did. That 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 was something that that was internal and external for for them. Can I say one thing? Yes, sir. Sister, uh, in this lesson, they kept talking about the Sadducees. Yes. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Stephen is is preaching the gospel. What is the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection. So it was, it was going against, contrary to what they believed. So they had to eliminate that. Period. Now, conversely, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They believed in afterlife. They believed in all those things. 
and they were strict guardians of the law. And I don't want to go into the history of that because we'll be here another 30 minutes. But, but what I'm saying is that you had, you had these different sects uh, on the Sanhedrin that had different beliefs. But they all came together when it came to Jesus and killing him. So as far as they were concerned, uh, Jesus was just, just a man. He was not God. He was not the Messiah that they looked for. And matter of fact, he claimed to be the Messiah, and, but, but he, he uh, died on a cross, right? He died on, the, on, uh, on a tree. Law says that curse is a man who's hung on a tree. You know, Brother Dave, and uh, I have right here in front of me uh, what Jesus is dealing with the scribes and the Pharisees over in uh, Matthew 23. Yeah. He goes over their whole history. You know, he, he breaks it down. You know, that first verse is, is, is a doozy because Jesus said, uh, you scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All uh, therefore, whatever they say, do observe. Uh, that uh, Whatever they tell you to observe, observe. But... Uh, that they observe and do, but do not do after their uh, works. For they say and do not what they say. So that whole chapter is dealing with Jesus, dealing with the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, how they're, they're uh, you know, just like Dave just said, they had a, they had a form of a right doctrine, but yet they, you know, uh, Jesus, was, uh, Jesus uncovered their hypocrisy right away. He let them know that they was phony. Yeah, and that was the key because yeah. they, they said, uh, Jesus told them, now you, you guys are hypocrites, but, but the people should do, you guys do, yeah. how do you put that? That's in verse, verse, verse one. Do what they say, but don't do what they do. That's about the best way I can say it. Exactly. Do what they say, uh, but don't do how they do. All right. Okay, you guys are taking me through my paces enough today. <laughs> Good job, Dad. So this was our lesson. When the world is against us, uh, and we've chronicled uh, the, uh, the events that uh, led to the persecution of the church and how, uh, I like pastors saying, how he, the Lord stirred the nest, got them out of their comfort zone. And, and as they ran, what did they do? They preached as they went. They preached as they went. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you.
As we find our ways out our seats, we'll begin. We'll, we'll resume midweek services. As we come to order, we'll resume our midweek services for today, March 20th, 2024. These are your announcements for today. The Easter lilies are on their way. The cost is $20. If you are interested in purchasing a lily or two, please see Sister Sheila Vasquez, or you can call or text her at 951-442-5746. Again, you can call or text her at 951-442-5746. 5746. Cash or checks are accepted. If you are paying by check, please make your check payable to Park Avenue Missionary Baptist Church. Mount Vernon Baptist Church will be celebrating its 79th church anniversary this Sunday, March 24th at 3.30 p.m. Pastor Campbell will bring the message so let's go fellowship and support our pastor. Amen. The church address is 5296 24th Street, Arupa Valley, California, 92509. The LB, the LB and Hattie Moss scholarship applications for 2024 graduates are available. All prospective 2024 graduates wishing to be considered Please see Sister Bessie Miller Gaylord or Sister Joyce Green of the committee for an application. Also, any preschool, grade school, or middle school students to be promoted should have their name, school, and promotion information given to Sister Patrice Livingston. The, I, I'm, I'm, I know, but I'm reading it as it's written. All right, great. Thank you. The end of the 2023 school year is fast approaching, so please pick up an application or get the information to the LB and Hattie Moss Scholarship Committee members as soon as you can. Thank you. From Bessie Miller Gaylord, President. The Good Samaritan Mission Circle meets every Wednesday on Zoom. The meeting time has been changed to 2 p.m. If you would like information on how to log on to their Wednesday Zoom meetings, and if you are interested in becoming a member of the Good Samaritans, please contact the church office for Sister Princess Jones, president telephone number, or see a member of the Good Samaritan Mission Circle. Your weekly announcements are as follows. At 10 a.m., Sunday school classes of all ages, However, the adult Sunday school class is in person and live streamed. Mondays at 10 a.m., we have our prayer call. Prayer leaders, Deacon John DuBose. <clears throat> On Wednesdays at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m., the Sunday school lesson and teachers meeting, prayer time and Bible study, in person and live streamed, held in the dining room. Fridays at 10 a.m., our second prayer call of the week, prayer leaders, Deacon Major Carter. Our prayer call line number is 1-605-475-4700 with the pin code of 849-592, pound or hashtag. These are your announcements for this morning. Please govern yourselves accordingly. Please pray for the sick and shut-in. Those that are homebound, in the hospital, in convalescent care, and those that have special needs. Continue to pray for our military personnel, our entire church family, 
Pastor Campbell and family, and those among us with unspoken prayer requests. Yeah. And lastly, we are still in bereavement with the family of Sister Roxy Webster. So as we ready ourselves to be instructed about the person of Jesus Christ by Reverend Dr. Greg Young, let us approach the throne of grace that the Holy Spirit will give us clarity of the content that we're about to receive, that we may be further strengthened as we march up the king's highway. Let us pray. Almighty God, thou who art the Alpha and the Omega, thou who is the first and the last, thou who has no beginning or end, thou who are most holy, righteous, and true, we come, Lord, with bowed heads and humbled hearts. With thanksgiving and praises upon our feeble lips unto thee, a holy and righteous God, who continues to let our hearts beat and the blood running warm in our veins. We say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And as we have come together to once more again to nourish that part of us which will live forever in your presence, our spirit, may we listen intently and purposely, Lord, as we are giving spiritual food to better enable us to be uh, proclaimers of your word through our words, thoughts, and our deeds. And then, Lord, we pray for our members who are uh, homebound, unable to come out and be in our midst, those who are in convalescent homes, those who are, uh, are in the hospitals, mm -hmm. Amen. and those who are dealing with uh, one uh, health condition or another who has uh, attacked their bodies. We pray, Lord, that they will continue to keep their eyes stayed on thee, their minds, their hearts, and feeding themselves from your word, that they may wax strong and continue to keep their hand in your hand. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, as we go into this study, please put us on one accord that would, you may speak to us individually and collectively, Lord, that we may be better servants of the Most High God. This we ask in Christ Jesus' name, and for his sake we pray. Amen. 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 Here now is our instructor, uh, Brother Dr. Gregory Young. Amen. Amen. I want to say, <coughs> I want to say good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. As we now embark on continuing our study of Christology. Again, I am uh, thankful to be able to do this. And let's just make sure everybody has, uh, you should have t two handouts. Um, one that says Christology, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, part two. And then I just could not have you write all of these down. And that's this uh, this went on Christology Day 3, which is a couple of uh, PowerPoints that I'm going to be using uh, to uh, give the arguments for the humanity of Jesus Christ as well as the uh, uh, arguments for his deity. All right. uh, again, uh, we are blessed to be under the leadership of uh, Pastor Ellie Campbell. He is certainly a blessing to my life, and I'm sure he's a blessing to all of you. And, and because of that, I, I'm trying to hurry through this so we can get back to the pastor's teaching. Because <laughs> I, I come for the same reason you come. I come to hear the pastor. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay, here we are. Uh, uh, once again, we're talking about Christology. When we speak of Christology, we're talking about the truth concerning Jesus Christ. It is a study of the doctrine concerning the truth regarding his person and work. Yes. And one of the things that I've endeavored to do uh, as, we talk about, uh, as we talk about Christology, I am trying to see him in all of his glory. Uh, I want to see him in all of his glory, especially coming from uh, my Catholic background. Uh, we have already talked about uh, his eternality and his preexistence, and we've talked about the deity of Christ. And I was trying to show it onto you today. Now we're going to be looking at the incarnation, and I wanted. To, and one of the things that I'm trying to stress is to show how 
all that God is, is going to be poured into Jesus Christ. Everybody there? All that he is. Now, Pastor mentioned something last week, and I just want to address it. Uh, I want to address it just very quickly. Uh, concerning the name El Shaddai. Concerning the name El Shaddai. Now, the word shad... The word shed means breast. B A S T? Something like that. <laughs> I'm just going to put a T on there. You know what I'm trying to spell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the word shed means breast. And so, uh, and it's, it's hard finding this in some commentaries, but it's certainly in the Jewish commentaries you'll find that El Shaddai means the God of many <coughs> breasts. And it's highlighting his sufficiency in providing all of the nourishment, his eminence in providing everything that you could ever need. Pastor told me that he preached a sermon talking about the feminine aspect of God. Correct, Pastor? Okay. And so therein applies the significance of the term El Shaddai. <laughs> and what was funny, this is, this is what was funny, because I hadn't heard that. And so I, I said, Sheree, you ever heard of of uh, the God of many brothers. She said, oh, yeah, that's what El Shaddai means. <laughs> the nurturing, it's the nurturing aspect of God. Everybody there? All right, let's move on. Now, we're going to talk, we're going to try to get three subjects out of the, uh, uh, three subjects t discussed today. Uh, we're going to talk about the incarnation of Christ. We're going to talk about the humanity of Jesus Christ. And then we're going to get into a little technical aspect Associated with the um, associated with the hypostatic union and what's called the what is called the um, kenosis theory or the kenosis uh, problem. So you might even want to just get your Bibles ready for that one. Uh, you just just flag uh, Philippians chapter two, and we'll take a look at that at verse. Uh, seven, we'll talk about that. But anyway, let's just move on. The incarnation means in flesh. He has come in the flesh. The eternal Son of God took on a human nature and came into the world in our likeness. The virgin birth was the means by which the incarnation took place. The virgin birth is essential to the incarnation. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. The virgin birth was the means whereby he escapes the corruption of our fallen sinful nature. Matthew 1 and 23 identifies Mary as the virgin. The gospel of Matthew and Luke make that perfectly clear. She is, or she was the child. She was with child before her and Joseph ever came, to, ever came to get together. And you know the story. Joseph said, what's up with that? Okay, and, okay in the Negro vernacular. <laughs> All right. The angel told Mary that her pregnancy was due to the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. That's in Luke chapter 1, verse 34 and 35. Now you will notice, you'll see this in 1 Corinthians, he is called, Jesus is called the second man. He is called the second man. Who was the first man? He was the first man. Adam was the first man. I'm, here we go. I'm going back to something that Dave brought up before that I said, so let me make sure you understand where I'm coming from now. How was Adam made? But how was he made? He was made out of the dust of the earth, right? And God breathed into him the breath of life. All right. So God is making a second man. Where is he getting the dust? Mary's the dust. 
Mary, you all right? <laughs> all right? All right. And the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary, and she is impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Everybody there? All right. So God has made a second man. That's why in 1 Corinthians, he's called the second man. He's the second man, Adam. Everybody okay? All right? And so here comes our supporting scripture. And then, as a matter of fact, I even got it in my notes. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. All right, let me get my screen to act right. It's not acting right, but that's okay. Here's our supporting evidence. Look at the verses. Here, here, here come the verses. We know that in talking about the incarnation, we have to go to John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh. And again now, everything that is the embodiment of the word, the word was God, the word was El Shaddai, the word was Jehovah Shalom, the, world, the word was Jehovah or Yahweh Tishkenu, Yahweh Nisi, the Lord our banner. Everything that God was becomes flesh. Everybody there? And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And then we're also going to make reference to Philippians. And I'm going to come back to Philippians. We're going to look at it now, but we're going to come back later when we take a look at the kenosis problem. But he made himself nothing taking upon the nature. I like how the King James says he made of himself no reputation, right? But he took on the nature of a servant being made in human likeness or being made in the likeness of man and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. All right? These are our supporting scriptures as they relate to the incarnation. Galatians chapter 4, verse, verses 4 and 5. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Sister Mitch, that was an outstanding question that you asked about how come they didn't want to let go of the law. The problem with the law was they did not understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. Matthew chapter 5, verses, uh, I want to say 17, somewhere around there. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. Jesus brought the law to its consummation. You don't sell a car or you don't, you don't go buy a new car and trade in your old car and drive your new car and come back and say, can I have my old car back too? <laughs> so they didn't want to let go of the law because for them, they got a whole lot of status from it. But Jesus came. He, t- he fulfilled the law. He was born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full right of sonship. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it's not included in your handout. And I'm in that uh, second, that part two handout, if you guys haven't seen that. I'm, I'm just going right down that script. But uh, uh, I added, though, I added uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, because it says... For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If God has hands, they got nail prints in them. Any and everything that, any any picture of God that you want to see, it's a picture of Jesus. Can I do this real quick? I, I, I keep talking about this passage, but I never really looked at it. And I want you to see it, though. I want you to see it very quickly. Go to Isaiah chapter 6 for me. Go to Isaiah chapter 6. You there? Let me, let me get my phone. Get my phone on my Bible because I want you to see this. Isaiah chapter 6. And if somebody wants to read that, you can go ahead and start reading it. From verse 1. In the year the king of died, I saw also the Lord. Okay, stop right there. Stop right there. Stop right there. Uh, yeah, you might, you, you mind going to the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> it's 
So I want you to see this. And if you got a Bible, you might even want to flag John chapter 12 as well. Okay? Go ahead, Lonnie. So in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. Okay, stop right there. No, keep going, keep going. High and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Thank you. Why don't you stay right there, though? Stay right there. Stay right there. Go ahead and find chapter 12, John chapter 12 for me. So my question to you is, who did Isaiah see? The Lord. He saw the Lord, did yeah, he not? That's what he said, yeah. All right? Everybody see that? Uh-huh. All right. I think all of us would gr agree that Isaiah saw God. In all of his glory, in all of his honor, yep. in all of his majesty. Yep. Can everybody see that? Yep. Now let's go to John chapter 12 and tell who John saw. He says he saw. John chapter 12. Hold on one minute there. Uh, hold on one minute yeah, there for me, uh, Lonnie. I'm, I'm, standing, I'm still in Isaiah. Okay, but you're going to John chapter 12. All right, thank you. I was trying to get Fat Boy to do it, but he won't do it. <laughs> John 12, where? All right. All right. Well, I, if, if I'm going to take you just right to the point, uh -huh. it'll be 1241. 1241. John 12, 41. You want to read it? Well, I'll tell you what. Start at 39. 39. John 12, 39 reads thusly. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he that blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see their, with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, and be converted, and I shall heal them. He said, these things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. He okay. saw his glory mm -hmm. and spoke of him. That's 41. Who is Isaiah talk, or who is John talking about in this chapter? Isaiah. But who is he talking about? God. He's talking about Jesus, mm -hmm. correct? And if you, if you read a few verses above that, you'll oh. see he's talking specifically about Jesus. And then he said, these things Isaiah, Isaiah saw. saw when he saw his glory. And so Isaiah, or John is telling us that what Isaiah saw in chapter 6 was Jesus in all of his glory. Everybody there? And so we see then the word now becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Everybody there? And then we have John 1.18. Thank you, sir. appreciate it. Thank you. I just want to make sure that you understand who Jesus really is. Now, we don't go as far as the apostolics. Everybody know the apostolics? Apostolic says it's Jesus only. They're so convinced that he's all God that there, there's nobody but Jesus. But we hold to the Trinity. There's a, good, there's a Father that's God, there's a Son that's God, and there's a Holy Spirit that is God. Everybody there? Amen. Now, look at John 1.18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. I mentioned last week, I mentioned last week that Pastor was saying, the only begotten is maybe not to, the best word for it. It talks about him being the unique one, the matchless one, the incomparable one. And I talked about Major's translation, the New Living Translation. It calls him the unique one. Right. <laughs> it's the monogenes, a genes, monogenes. I meant to bring my uh, logos and sort of pronounce it for you, but you don't really care about that. <laughs> All right. All right. So we have, we've established that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. Anybody have any problem with that? Everybody good? All right, good, good. We're making, we're making good time then. 
then let's go to the humanity of Jesus. Uh, did I put both of them up there? No problem. I'll get to, to, I'll get to all of that. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. Now I'm, now I'm in, uh, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 1, and I'm going to be in Luke chapter, I want to say Luke chapter 3, if you just want to track where I am as far as what I'm talking about. It is generally, no, genealogies were very important for the Jews, for without them, they could not prove their tribal membership or their uh, right to inheritances. Anyone claiming to be the son of David had to be able to prove it. Everybody there? Now, it is generally concluded that Matthew gave our Lord's family tree through King David's son, Solomon, and ultimately through his foster father, Joseph. Joseph actually comes through the kings of Israel. Everybody with me? Joseph is a direct descendant of the kings. Now, I need you to make sure you follow me. Everybody got that? Jesus could not come through that genealogy. He could not come through that genealogy because that genealogy was cursed under King Jeconiah. Everybody with me? Jeconiah, Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 29 and 30. God said, curse be the, his, his, his descendants. No child of his will sit on the throne. And this is why we know that Matthew's genealogy is Joseph's genealogy. Everybody there? Jeconiah, I think it's Jeconiah. But as you, if, if you're looking at verse in Matthew, verse 11 and 12, that's when they go into Babylonian captivity. Now, if you check both genealogies, there is one name in there that uh, kind of throws everything off, and that's Shealtiel. Because Shealtiel shows up in both genealogies. But we know that Mary's genealogy is over here in the gospel according to Luke. All right. And Jesus comes through Mary's genealogy. Everybody got that? What was it, Jeremiah what? Jeremiah 22, I think it's 29 and 30. And, 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 and Wes, if you got it, go ahead and just read it. Well, I don't have it. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Okay, Joseph's genealogy is recorded for us in Matthew. So Joseph comes through all the kings of Israel. That is, that, 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 that's undisputed. They, he comes through Solomon's line. Okay, you got David and then you got Solomon. Right. All right. Mary comes through Nathan's line. All right, you got that? Solomon had two sons. He probably had more than two. I, I would imagine if you got 300 wives and 700 concubines, <laughs> you got some child, You got a whole lot of child support and alimony to pay. <laughs> That's Sandra's department. <laughs> okay. Bathsheba had four sons. The two that we're concerned about is Solomon and the son Nathan. Everybody with me? Mary comes through Nathan. Now, notice nobody in that line sat on the throne. Jesus is going to be the king that sits on that throne. We'll talk about that when we talk about the, the offices of Jesus Christ. Is everybody there? Anybody confused? Anybody lost? You did, you did say 20, uh, chapter 22, 29, and 30? Yeah, did, is, that what, is that what it is? Well, I'm reading here, O earth, O earth. It says, O, o earth, earth, earth. Hear listen, the words listen, of the listen. Lord. Okay, go ahead. Let, go ahead. Let me, let, let me let you read that. Hear the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless. Write him down as childless. A man who shall not pr prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall, shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any, any more in Judah. There you go. It's Jeconiah, right? That's Jeremiah. No, I mean, the king is Jeconiah? Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Because of his idolatry, because of, I mean, 
when you see the fall of when you see the fall of Judah and them going into Bab Babylonian captivity, it's a it's a mess. All right, how are we doing? Everybody still with me? I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. I haven't left anybody in the dust. Because we're going to do that when we get to talk about the hypostatic union and the kenosis problem. <laughs> okay. So, so far, so good. All right. Everybody understand the genealogy? Yeah. Understanding that Mary's genealogy is what we have in the gospel according to Luke. Major, did I answer your question? Okay. Major's, or, uh, Major's genealogy. <laughs> Mary's genealogy is the one that we have in the gospel according to Luke. Mary was just as much a sinner as all of other human beings are. You cannot go through the Catholic theology of immaculate conception because it's not Jesus that they say was immaculately conceived. It's Mary that they say was immaculately conceived. And I assure you she wasn't. Mary needed a savior just like you and I needed a savior. She was likely much better morally and spiritually than most people of her time, but she was not sinless. She was deeply devout and faithful to the Lord as demonstrated by her humble and submissive response to the angel's announcement shown in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. The Brother humanity... Teacher, oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Mary knew it. Knew what? She knew she was a sinner and needed a savior. She knew it. And yeah. she verbalized it. She verbalized it, yes. In her, uh, her praise song. Okay, and see, here's, here's, the, here's the thing, though. She verbalized it under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And that's how, that's how, we, that's how we realize we're sinners. She verbalized Yeah. Yes, yes, because she was filled with the Holy Spirit. and right. Yeah, oh, yeah, outstanding. The humanity of Christ is necessary if he is to die for the sinner's sin. The true humanity of Jesus Christ is taught in the New Testament. I'm, I'm, and I'm not rushing. I'm really not rushing. But you're going to have to really take all of this in consideration when we start talking about the hypostatic union. We start talking about that. And remember now, we spent a great deal of time on that when we were talking about church councils. This hypostatic union, we talked about the Chalcedonian definition, and I'm going to leave all that to your notes because you had that in the, uh, in, in the previous section. John the Apostle is writing in his first epistle to combat the doctrine, uh, the doctrinal error of the Gnostics, to combat the doc doctrinal error of the Gnostics that influenced the church well into the second century. And so uh, John... He says in chapter 4, now, if you recall, uh, most of you, much of you were here when I did the, uh, when I did the uh, exposition and for my doctorate, when I was working on my doctorate, you guys had to all help me with that. Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> but uh, it was a, there was a reason why I had you, um, we all worked on 1 John, is that correct? Right. We were all working on 1 John. And there was a reason I had you do that for the same reason John wrote it. He's combating the Gnostic era. He says, beloved, do not believe every spirit. This is John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. The Gnostics taught that Jesus just appeared as a man, but he really was a phantom or a ghost when he walked. He <laughs> left no footprints. He left no, when he walked, he left no footprints on the ground. And John combats this right in verse 1. He wants you to know that which we have seen, we have seen him with our own eyes. We have heard him with our own ears. We have touched him with our own hands. We did not touch a phantom or a ghost. We touched a man of flesh and bone. Everybody with me? The Docetic Gospels, like all Gnostic groups, believe that Jesus was not human. 
If he was human, he could not have experienced the pain of the crucifixion. Therefore, his death would have been a sham. All right? And this is goes, and, and, and Jehovah Witnesses will say that he rose, but he rose spiritually. He did not raise in a bodily form. Just to highlight some more of their errors. All right? Jesus Christ had a human body of flesh and blood being born of the Virgin Mary, whose womb was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he escaped the corruption of the sinful, depraved nature that all of us has inherited from corruption. Soon as you popped out of your mama's womb, you popped out a sinner. You popped out a sinner in need of a savior. Jesus had a normal human development. He needed to sleep just like we do. He was thirsty as humans are, so on and so forth. He was a human. Human experience, needless to say, he experienced pain. He experienced the suffering in his body. He was beaten and crucified. He was crucified as a real man. There was nothing of the pain and suffering of the crucifixion that he was able to escape. And this is why he is in the garden sweating great drops of blood because he said, if it be thy will, let this cup pass for me. All right? As a man, Christ came into the world to save sinners. Timothy 1 and 5, he came for no other purpose than to redeem those whom his father had given, given him. It was necessary for the Word, the second person of the Trinity, to become human to fulfill God's plan uh, to redeem human mankind. If you ever want to get, well, maybe not you, but, uh, I, and I told you about, I told you about Dr. Sam. I told you about Dr. Sam, Dr. Sam Mikulowski. Dr. Sam talked about God, his discussion of God was so profound that you could have heard a pin drop on carpet. We, we were sat there in awe, and, 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 and after he talked about God, I wanted to be able to talk about God like he talked about God. So I studied everything I could on systematic theology. I'm reading Louis Barry Safer's systematic theology now. Uh, Emory Bancroft, I, I love his book, I guess the book I gave you, uh, on systematic theology, because I wanted to be able to talk about God like he talked about God. But I got caught up in soteriology. I, it, it's amazing to me the length that God has gone to redeem you and me. Yes. Right. Vanessa Bell Armstrong, she has a song. I don't know why Jesus loved me. I don't know why he cares. Uh -huh. I, to the, for the life of me, I don't understand why he loves me. Yeah. And I don't understand why he cares. But the great length at which he went to redeem us is utterly astounding to me. So instead of camping in theology proper, which is the doctrine of God, I camp in the doctrine of soteriology, which is the doctrine of our salvation. And somewhere in here, and I'll, and I'll, just, I'll just wait till I come through it in my notes, but it talks about the, the Bible is about our redemption. The whole subject is about our redemption. Let me, oh, good. I got, I'm still good on time. All right. So it was necessary for the word, the second person of the Trinity, the El Shaddai, the Yahweh, all that God is, uh, the third person of the Trinity, to become human to fulfill God's plan to redeem fallen humankind or fallen mankind. All right, now I gave you this one because I didn't want you to have to take a whole bunch of notes because I'm getting ready to give you the nine arguments for the humanity of Jesus Christ. Although, after I, Joni, after I looked at it, it's only eight. <laughs> I went from four to six. <laughs> All right. But what happened was, what happened was, I just looked at all of the, uh, I looked at Charles Hodge, I looked at Wayne Grudem, I looked at Charles Ryrie. So I ended up having about 13, 13 or 14 reasons why he had to come as a man. And I said, well, let me just kind of whittle this down a little bit. And I got it down to, to nine, and then it, and I thought I put nine on the screen, but it's actually eight. But I'll give you a ninth one anyway. All right, here are the eight arguments for the humanity of Jesus Christ. You have this handout, uh, and so you don't have to worry about uh, 
taking a bunch of notes because uh, Sister Mason back there, she gets to write and you see smoke coming out of her pen. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> All right. All right, here we go. Number one, it was for his representative obedience. The representative obedience. The representative obedience is captured in the Holy Spirit driving him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, all right? Where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. Where the first man failed, the second man succeeds. And this is captured in Romans chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Here's the key, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, yes, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Right. Number two, his humanity was necessary to be a suitable substitute. For he is, he is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Sorry, you didn't get that. He is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. His humanity was necessary so that he should suffer and die, and in doing so, Jesus fulfills all righteousness. We saw that, number one, first, and when he was baptized. He told, he told John the Baptist, he says, suffer it to be so, for it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. And then over there in Romans 8, 1 through 4, therefore there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. He fulfills all righteousness. Number four, his humanity was necessary to sympathize with us as our high priest. Now I gave you Romans or Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, therefore let us come boldly through the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I'll never forget, I'll never forget Pastor's sermon on Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, where it said, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. All right? I think it was called the death of death. <laughs> I can't remember, Pastor, but I, but I remember him preaching that sermon. Everybody there? All right. Number five, to be the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2 and 5. And then he is to be our pattern of an example, or to be our example and pattern in life. I like how when we were talking about last week's lesson. When he was reviled, he did not revile. Yeah? So he's our, he's our pattern in life. How are we doing? Everybody with me? Am I going too fast? <clears throat> oh, yeah, well, because I had to fix my slide. <laughs> but, you, but you still have them. <laughs> Remember, some of this stuff is hot off the press. <laughs> like, right. I'm, I'm looking at my clock. It says 9.55. I said, I got to print and go. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, so my numbers are right. Yours are, uh, that should have been number six, to be our mediator. Number seven should say, be our example and pattern of life. And then number eight, number eight, uh, or to, I don't know what number it is on yours. You'll just, you'll just, you'll just roll with me. <laughs> To destroy the works of the devil, to destroy the works of the devil. First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? And then to be uh, the pattern of our redeemed bodies. First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, it's actually verses 47 through 49, but it says, as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Those are, uh, those are very good passages. Uh, I would strongly suggest that if you have time that you take a look at those. We've got, we got some time, so we're going to be in good shape today.
All right, and then here comes the arguments for his deity. The arguments for his deity. Uh, here it is appropriate to recognize that it's crucially important to insist on the full deity of Christ as well, not only because it is clearly taught in Scripture, but also because only someone who is infinite, who is the infinite God, could bear the full penalty for all the sins of all of those who would believe in him. Number two, salvation is from the Lord. This is in Jonah. And the whole, here it is, this is what I was alluding to earlier. And the whole message of Scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation is designed to show that no human being, no creature could ever save man. Only God himself could save you. It is God who saved you. Everybody there? Yeah. Then number three, and only someone who was truly and fully God could be the one mediator between God and man. Uh, uh, Job, Job chapter 9, Job chapter 9, verse 10. I want to say it's verse 10. Job prayed, he, he, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but Job said, I just wish there was somebody who could just stand between me and you. Wish he had a, had a mediator. And then in 36 or somewhere along in there, Elihu says, I am the answer to your prayer. <laughs> One of the biggest, uh, what is that, uh, mysteries in uh, the Bible. Who is Elihu? <laughs> All right. All right, let me, keep, let me move on. Uh, and then thus, if Jesus is not fully God and fully man, we have no salvation, and ultimately we have no Christianity. And that's a natural segue into the hypostatic union. Natural segue into the hypostatic union. We've talked about it. What is the hypostatic union? Since we've covered it so thoroughly in church council. <laughs> what is? What is? And remember, now I'm in the, I was in the Marine Corps. In the Marine Corps, if you wasn't cheating, you wasn't trying. <laughs> so, so if you want to read the notes, read the notes. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody, what is the hypostatic union? There you go. Keep going, keep going. You got to keep. Amen. The Antarctic person, the God-man. Let me read that for the benefit of those who are listening online. The meaning of the hypostatic union, the hypostatic union may de be defined as the second person, the pre-incarnate Christ, came and took to himself a human nature and remains forever undiminished deity and true humanity united in one person forever. When Christ came, a person came. Not just the nature. He took on, and this is important. This is important. He took on an additional nature, a human nature. He did not simply dwell in a human body. The result of this union of the two natures is called a theanthropic person. I think you pronounce it better there, uh, Brother Lenny. <laughs> but it is the God man. So much so, and we talked about this in the, in the church councils. He is 100% God and 100% man, so much so, if he were not all God, he would be all man. And if he were not all man, he would be all God. Everybody there? Explanation of the hypostatic union. The two natures of Christ are inseparably united without mixture or loss of separate identity. He remains forever the God-man, fully God and fully man, two distinct natures in one person. Though Christ sometimes operated in a sphere of his humanity, and in other cases in the sphere of his divinity, in all cases what he did, or what he did and what he was, could be attributed to his one person. Let me give you an example. In the sphere of his humanity, he tired, he hungered, he thirsted. Everybody there? 
in the sphere of his divinity, his deity, he walked on water. He calmed the raging sea. Everybody there? He calmed the raging sea. He fed more than 5,000 with two, five barley loaves and two small fishes. Everybody there? Uh, go for it. Okay, question. I got a, I got a passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And this, I'm going to put this in the form of a question, Greg. Uh, because you're my teacher, man. You ain't messing with me, are you? No, I ain't messing with you this time. I mess with you other times, not this time. All right, go ahead. Okay, it says right here, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are, sa are saved it is the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to uh, nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now, Paul goes over a list of things right here. I'm not going to go over all of it. Uh, it, it how come uh, the gospel is clear to some and not to others? Some That's people can just not grasp what you're teaching. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's over their head, really. Uh, how, can, how can a person really grasp? I mean, how can, how can some people be blinded to the truth and some receive the truth? Some people just don't want to get it anyway. Is that, is that, the, is that, I'm going to answer my own question. You answer your own question. And pe some people just don't want to get it. Exactly. And that's called being lazy minded. Am I right? All right. How about, I, this, I, is I class, this is the second class I've had of yours, man. You helped me a lot. All right. Here we go. Amen. All right. Even though it is evident there were two natures in Christ, he never was considered a dual personality. In summarizing the hypostatic union, Three facts are noted. Number one, Christ has two distinct natures, humanity and deity, and there is no mixture or intermingling of the two natures, and this is the main point. Although he has two natures, Christ is one person. All right? He's one person. Now, here, go, here come some of the problems with the hypostatic union. The major difficulty in this doctrine involves the relationship of the two natures, uh, in Jesus Christ, several opinions have been developed. We pretty much fall in line with the Calvinistic position, but uh, here it is. John taught that the two natures are united without any transfer or of attributes. An attribute could not be taken away from a nature without changing the essence of the nature. And so Wolver states, and this is the main thing I want you to get out of this one, the two natures are united without loss of any of the essential attributes and that the two natures maintain their separate identity. There can be no mixture of the two natures. Infinity cannot be transferred to the finite. Mind cannot be transferred to matter. God cannot be transferred to man or vice versa. To rob the divine nature, here's the second point I want you to grab. To rob the divine nature of God of a single attribute would destroy his de deity, and to rob man of a single human attribute would result in the destruction of his true humanity. It is for this reason that the two natures of Christ cannot lose or transfer a single attribute. And again, I believe the uh, Calvinistic position is the correct one. In other words, the Calvinistic view maintains that the divine attributes are not diminished. Now we're going to talk about that, not diminished or compromised by Christ taking on a human nature in the incarnation. Rather, they are affirmed that Christ, while fully human, never cease to be divine. And we're going to deal with that in a minute when we talk about the kenosis theory. Uh, I think we'll have a couple minutes just to finish that up. All right. The Lutheran view, the Lutheran view, bottom line, is called consubstantiation. Okay? Remember, if there was a time when a pastor would be doing communion. He would say, we do not believe in substantiation and we do not believe in consubstantiation. All right? We believe that the... Uh, communion service is a memorial service. Right. Jesus said, do this in memory of me, all right? So the Lutheran position is simply stated as this. The Lutheran's view of the two natures teaches that the attributes of the divine nature are extended to the human nature with some important results. The Lutheran emphasizes the fullness of both natures in Christ. One important doctrinal distinction uh, when doctrinal result is the ubiquity of the human body of Christ. And I had to look up the word ubiquity, so we're, in all, we're all on the same page. 
<laughs> Remember, I was in the Marine Corps. Intelligence is not our strong suit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. But uh, uh, Pastor does a beautiful job of telling you exactly what it means in the next sentence. That is, the omnipresence of the divine nature of Christ is transferred to the human body of Christ. So consequently, and this is what consubstantiation is, and I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just give it to you. The human nature of Christ has passed into ubiquitous, omnipresence state at his ascension and is physically present in the elements of the communion. So when they say that when they take the blood and the wine, they say Christ is present within, above, and around. And, uh, I mean, we already know he's there, but this is a big deal that they make out of it. Everybody there? Okay. That is called consubstantiation. What's the other one? Transubstantiation. Yeah, there you go. Transubstantiation, uh, that's what the Catholics believe. They believe that the bread and the wine physically change into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Consubstantiation says Jesus is in the presence of the bread and the wine. How are we doing? If that's blowing you away, keep let it go. All right. <laughs> Just let it go. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here's the results. Here's the results. Uh, Pastor, we okay? Okay. All right. I told Pastor if I get hung up, he can help me. <laughs> All right. Results of the uh, hypostatic union. Both natures are necessary for redemption. As a man, Christ can represent man and die as a man, and as God the death of Christ could have infinite value for it is sufficient to provide redemption for the sins of the world. The eternal priesthood of Christ is based upon the hypostatic union. He had to be all man. By incarnation, he became man and hence could act as a human priest. And as God, his priesthood could be an everlasting priesthood after the order of Melchizedek and he properly could be the mediator between God and man. Would you bear with me while I finish up the uh, kenosis theory? Okay? I have 10 minutes tops, if, if that. 10 minutes if Tracy don't ask no questions. <laughs> there you go, there you go. I ain't going to ask no questions. Right. You know you're good with me. <laughs> okay. Flow now, with it, man. Flow with it. Okay, everybody got everybody got uh, <laughs> Philippians chapter two. Yes. Everybody have Philippians chapter two because, uh, and you have these notes in your handout. You have them in your handout. There's a couple of things you don't have in your handout, but you'll be all right. Uh, and that's in the uh, the first handout. The kenosis problem involves the interpretation of Philippians chapter two, verse seven, where it said he emptied himself. Everybody there? Yeah. He emptied himself. Everybody got uh, Philippians chapter 2. Chapter 2. I started at verse 7. But let me just back up just a little bit, if you don't mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, have this attitude in yourself, but always who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Everybody see that? Yeah. He emptied himself. So the question is, of what did Christ empty himself? Anybody got any thoughts? He emptied himself of his humanity? Major, you were in the Navy. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. No, be careful, be careful, because he's still God. So, uh, Mitch, you had something. Right, keep going. Okay, you, you, you're reading just a little too far, a little too far, because I'm getting there. I'm, I'm going to get there, but you're reading a little too far. But does the King James Version say he emptied himself? No. Made himself of no reputation. Okay, everybody there? All right. All right. 
What does it say in verse 7 in the New King James? Okay, that's verse 7. Yeah. The Greek word in there is ekinosin. He emptied himself. Okay? He emptied himself, taking, taking upon a form of a servant. He made himself no reputation. All right? All right, so of what did Christ empty himself? Liberal theologians suggest Christ emptied himself of his deity. He emptied himself of his deity, but he didn't do that, Major. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. But it is evident from his life and ministry that he did not empty himself of his deity, for his deity was displayed on numerous occasions. Once again, he walked on water. Okay? Turned water into wine. He calmed the raging seas. Those were all manifestations of his deity. What happened at the mountain of transfiguration? Everybody there? Two main points, two main points may be observed. Christ merely, now this is where it gets a little technical, so ride along with me. Everybody ride along with me, okay? Make sure you ride along with me on this one. Christ merely surrendered the independent exercise of his relative or transitive attributes. He did not surrender the absolute or imminent attributes in any sense. Let me explain that, okay? I want to explain that. For example, the immensity of God. The immensity of God. In him we live and move and have our being. Everybody with me? The immensity of God is an absolute attribute. Everybody with me? While his omnipresence is a relative attribute. Everybody got that? Therefore, Jesus maintained the immensity of being God, but surrendered the relative attribute of being omnipresent during his earthly ministry. It's, it's, it's apparent that in his earthly ministry, he couldn't be everywhere at all times. Everybody get that? That is a relative attribute. He surrendered the absolute attribute, but maintain, or he surrendered the relative attribute, but maintain the absolute attribute of being God. Tell me if you understand what I'm saying. Everybody there? Let me give you another example. This one is good. This is a real good one here. <laughs> this is real good. Everybody remember when he went to the high priest, and the high priest, I forgot what the, what is, or anyway, he went to the high priest, and the joker slapped him. Everybody got that? Everybody got that? <laughs> Watch this. God's holiness is an absolute attribute, and it is expressed in the relative attribute of vindictive or divine justice following his righteous indignation. How many times did God just poof? <laughs> you mess up, poof, you're gone. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> You just imagine the scene in uh, imagine the scene in the movie Ten Commandments. Moses comes down the hill. They got a golden calf, right? Yeah. He takes the Ten Commandments and he throws them at the calf, and the earth opens up and swallows up a bunch of people. That's God's d d vindictive judgment. <laughs> Why? Because they transgress His holiness. Everybody with me? Okay, Watch this. And yet Jesus. He surrendered the, indi the independent exercise of his divine judgment, and yet he was always perfectly holy, just, righteous. For example, the woman that was caught in adultery. Adultery. Poof, you go. <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? That the vindictive judgment was... Set aside, he did not exercise vindictive judgment immediately or, or, or independent of what God would do. In other words, when, he, when the guy slapped him, how many of y'all going to let somebody just slap you like that? God would have, 
He could have turned that man to pillar of salt right there. But he did not. He did not. So those are what he gave up. So watch what happens now. Watch what happens. And I'm almost done. Yes, sir. Vindictive judgment. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they're dead. No opportunity for them to be saved under any circumstances. When you go to hell, hey, were you floating around the Red Sea? <laughs> All right, everybody get that though. And then there, there's another subtle case that I was going to mention, but it 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 always it always just kind of bothers me. Anybody remember Uriah? They're, they're carrying the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, and the ox stumbles. And Uzziah, okay, okay. And he tries to hold it up and dies right there on the spot because he touched something that was holy. All right? So does everybody understand now what he's sacrificing? And the text does a very good job of telling you exactly what that means, and I'll read this and I'll be done. All right? God is omniscient, and yet Jesus surrenders the exercise of the independent exercise of his omniscience. Now, this is a very good one, and you have this one in your notes. So go back and take a look at Matthew 24 and 36, because Jesus has surrendered his omniscience. He said, no man knows the day or the hour, not even the Son of Man. Everybody there? Mm -hmm. Christ took to himself an additional nature. Here's, here's, the, here's the, the, the closing comment. Christ took to himself an additional nature. The context of Philippians 2 and 7 provides the best solution to the kenosis problem. The emptying was not a subtraction, but an addition. The four following phrases, here you go, Mitch. The four following phrases explain the emptying. Number one, he took on the form of a bondservant. He took that on. Being made in the likeness of man and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. This is the kenosis problem. This is the emptying. In other words, Jesus would not do anything independent of his father. All right? Oop. Any questions? The emptying of Christ was taking on additional uh, nature or human nature with its limitations, but Jesus never, not for a fraction of a second at any time, gave up his deity. All right? Are we there? <laughs> All right. We are done. Uh, next time, uh, we may be able to finish this up next week, Pastor. Well, we'll be able to finish it up for the day shift because uh, we missed the night shift last week. But uh, we'll take a look at uh, the temptation of Jesus Christ. If you have the notes on that, uh, kind of read up on that. Uh, because um, uh, I was a strong advocate of the peccability of Jesus Christ. And uh, Pastor took me and Major, I remember when Pastor took me and Major aside and straightened us out on the five points of Calvinism. <laughs> but Pastor straightened us up on the, uh, on the difference, or, or on the impeccability, the impeccability of Jesus Christ. So we'll be talking about that, but I think, uh, I think we may be able to finish up next week. If not, we'll finish up within the next two weeks, Pastor. Okay? Any questions? Mitch? You all right? All right. Tracy? Tracy, you all right? He left, so he's good. <laughs> Let us pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. Brother Portlock, you all right? All right. Our Father and our God, we praise you. We honor you. We, we thank you. We just hope, oh Lord, that in this study we are getting able to get a glimpse of your majesty that you have presented in the person of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now we ask that you help us to hide your word in our hearts, O oh God, that we might not sin against you. Continue watching over our pastor. Continue watching over Dave as he prepares to teach again tonight. And continue to watch over each and every one of us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.
All right, good. Uh huh. He couldn't be. No, he couldn't be. No. How you doing there, Major? 